So now, put your hands together. I'm going to invite Jess Paul to the stage to share a story. Well, I can't, is this on? I can't see any of you, so I think that's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, my name is Jess Paul, as Ashley mentioned, and um, I've been practicing this in my car for six weeks. So my car has gotten really bored of it, so I'm glad I have an opportunity to share it with you tonight. Um, Ashley first contacted me about six weeks ago about standing up here tonight. And when she told me what the theme was, the obstacle is the way, I immediately knew I had to say yes. There are some very obvious reasons for that that I will get into. There are some less obvious reasons that I hope I can illuminate through this story tonight. Um, but the first one is that uh, I am an obstacle course race athlete. I run obstacle course races. And I, uh, Five years ago, I didn't know that that sport actually existed. Um, and it was thanks to a wonderful place that I found in 2014 called Readiness Fitness um, that I discovered Spartan racing. Has anybody heard of Spartan racing? <laughs> We're all a little crazy, they say. So obstacle course racing um, changed my life in ways that I can't even begin to explain in some ways that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with obstacle course racing, a brief synopsis. So I run what's called a Spartan race. And Spartan racing is the most popular obstacle course race there is on the planet right now. These races are run around the world and they are run by millions of people every year. The goal of Spartan race is to get people off the couch onto the course and to the finish line. Now every Spartan race, there are different distances, but there will always be obstacles in common in these races. The first one that you will encounter in a Spartan race is the terrain. So the races are either held somewhere in nature, so a mountain, um, maybe a ski resort, you're still in nature, but you're up and down a black diamond uh, ski route. Uh, perhaps you're in a forest along forest trails and rivers or maybe it's sand dunes, or you might actually be on a motocross track. So the first obstacle is the terrain, and you have to usually run most of the time, or hike, and that is obstacle number one. There are also a number of other physical obstacles in these races um, that are constructed, man-made, that you have to come up against. And from race to race, the obstacles are fairly standardized, so you have some idea of what to expect. Um, but you'll never know what order those races will come in. You'll never know if there might be four grouped all at the same time or when they will appear in a race until that morning when you see the map and go, oh, yes. So those are the obstacles in the races. And they can vary from either being on your belly in the dirt and the mud under barbed wire for a quarter of a mile, depending on the weather. You may have to, as we like to say, carry heavy shit. So it might be a big atlas stone or a, a log that you're carrying above your shoulders. Uh, you might have to drag a cinder block behind you on a chain. You might also be handed a bucket full of gravel just when you think the race is over and they send you back up the hill again. Huh? Anyways, so there's all these obstacles. You may have to go across monkey bars or rings or a combination of monkey bars and rings and sticks and balls. That's called the rig. It's very nasty. Um, you'll also have to get your ass up over a wall. Four foot at the beginning of the race, you start in this little starting block with everybody all huddled together. And the first thing is a four foot wall. And then there's six foot walls, and eight foot walls, and 10 foot walls, and inverted walls that go like this, and cargo net walls, and lots of walls. <laughs> you may also have to go up a rope by yourself and ring a bell at the top. That was always my nemesis. The last obstacle in these races is what is known as the burpee. Anybody familiar with the burpee? <laughs> For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting the burpee yet, a burpee you need to, I'm not going to demonstrate, I'm in heels tonight, but you jump up and you come down into a squat, you kick your feet back, go down into a push-up, bring the feet forward and jump back up. That's one. If you miss an obstacle in a Spartan race, you have to do 30 in a row. <laughs> no sharing. 
And so that's the last obstacle. And so what I love about these races is that when you're out there on the course, especially if you run what's known as a competitive heat, and that's what I tend to run, you can't get any help. And so it's you and you and you on the course. And it is a wonderful moment in time to figure out what you're capable of, how strong you are, how fast you are, can you lift heavy shit, you know, all of those things. And it's also about this thing, can you turn this off enough to just keep going? And so I love that obstacle course racing. When you finish a race, there is no greater feeling, especially at the end of a Spartan race. There's a bunch of logs that are on fire at the finish line that you get to jump over. <laughs> Woo! And you feel amazing. They say in Spartan race, you'll know at the finish line. And you really do. The first time I ran a race, I was just filled with this incredible sense of accomplishment, and I was hooked. So much so that I've been racing uh, competitively for the last four years. I recently got certified as a Spartan coach and will start teaching people to run obstacle course races this fall. And as I said, it's changed my life. I completed um, some races in the last little while where I qualified for the obstacle course race world championship. I had no idea such a thing existed when I qualified. Um, but being the competitive person that I am, it kind of piqued my curiosity and it was in Ontario, so it was close. I had some air miles and some courage, so I decided that I couldn't not go. And so I traveled to Ontario by myself, drove up to Collingwood. It was a beautiful fall weekend, actually two years ago this weekend. And I was in awe. This wasn't just a Spartan race. You can qualify for this race at Spartan races, but you also can qualify through Tough Mudder and obstacle courses from around the world. So at this race, there were flags from all of these countries. There were athletes from 46 nations coming to participate. I got my badge, it had my name and the Canadian flag, and I said, like, why am I here? <laughs> it was very daunting. Um, and not only were there athletes there from 46 countries, there were obstacles in this race from all over the world that I had never, ever seen before. Basically, they took the toughest obstacles from all of these races and brought them all to Ontario and said, fill your boots. So my race that day was a 15 kilometer race with 50 obstacles. Not 15, 50, 50. And um, not that it was daunting at all yet. So I got out on the course and this race was different. There were no burpee penalties, thank goodness. And they gave you a band that you could wear on your wrist. <coughs> and it was like one of those rubber bands that you wear to raise awareness for breast cancer or something like that. And you were allowed to keep your band for the entire race as long as you completed every obstacle successfully. So if you finished the race with a band intact, you had completed 50 obstacles without failing. I knew that wasn't going to happen. I'd never seen some of these obstacles before. My goal going into this race was simply, why well, I usually have four when I race. The first one is have fun. The second one is do your best. The third one is don't get hurt. And the fourth one is finish. And I finished all my races so far. So I'm about a quarter of the way into this race. And because I haven't seen a lot of these obstacles, I would pause and just watch. There were some crazy people there who were really crazy athletes, like monkeys. And it was amazing to watch. But I would just pause and observe how they would approach these obstacles because some of them I had no idea where to begin. So we're running down, we'd already been up the mountain once and we're coming down the slope and we come up to this obstacle and it's really difficult to actually see what the obstacle is because there's this big wall. And it was probably, well in my dreams it's 20 feet tall, um, but it was probably about 10 feet by 10 feet, big wall, and there were ropes coming over the top. And so I stopped for a minute to watch and people would grab the rope and they'd put their foot on and they'd climb up to the top. And some of them would climb up and kind of take a glance and then they'd come back down again and they'd go get their band cut. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, that, that can't be the obstacle. This is the world championships. That's way too easy. And I was right. They went up to the top and saw what they were supposed to do and they voluntarily came back down and had their band cut. So immediately my heart starts to race and I'm getting anxious and a little scared. It's scary shit this stuff sometimes. So I 
get on the rope and I get up the wall and I'm standing at the top and there are these two people beside me and their feet are stuck. They're just stuck there. They've been standing there apparently for 10 minutes looking. And I look down, I'm on like this three foot platform and it just drops all the way back to the ground. Someone has put some hay down there just in case you fall, thank you. And, and then I look across and it's about six feet and there's another platform. And I look at the race volunteer and I look across the way and there's a bar there. And she says to me, all you have to do is jump. <laughs> six feet, 10 feet down, hay at the bottom, holy shit. Um, and these people are paralyzed here and then they go back down. Well, I still had my band and I didn't want to go back down the rope, and I certainly didn't want to go down the hole. So in that moment, I made a decision in that split second that I was going to do it. And I called upon a mantra that I use in my training and in my life. I, I say push play, because sometimes if you think about something for too long, you just, you, you will, you'll paralyze yourself, right? So I couldn't think about it, I couldn't look down. I kind of closed my eyes and said a small prayer and I envisioned like Super Mario jumping from green pipe to green pipe. <laughs> and I opened my eyes again and I got down and loaded up the engine, that's what I call this. Got down and I got my arms back and I just, and I left. And I fucking grabbed the bar. Woo! And I nailed it! It was like, it was like this crazy feeling of elation and in the split second I'd made this decision and I'd, dug really deep and I found something deep inside me that got me across this obstacle. And it, it changed the race. Like I, I was in disbelief. I looked back and I was like, holy shit, I got across that. Well, it was a good thing because then I had to do it again. <laughs> it was two. So I did it. And that just filled me with this incredible um, sense of accomplishment for the rest of the race. I did lose my band, I think, the next obstacle, but no, I didn't care because I'd conquered what they called the dragon's back. And I found out the next day after the race that some of the most elite obstacle course racers in the world had quit at that obstacle. They didn't want to get their band cut, so they got a do not finish. So those split sec that split second decision of a leap of faith not only changed my race that day, it changed every other race that I have run, but it also changed something in me that's changed my life. And to illustrate how this has helped me, I need to take you back about six weeks. It was actually just two days before Ashley contacted me about speaking here tonight. And it was a Friday night, and I was in my kitchen. Um, I just got my boys to bed. I have a five-year-old and a 10-year-old boy. So if anybody needs any fart jokes for their repertoire, um, please find me later. I will help you out. So they were down for the night. Um, my husband was out working. He has a wood shop in the garage at the back. And he was out fiddling with something, making something. He likes to escape there. And I was in the kitchen getting stuff tidied up. And my phone dinged. And um, we were going to watch a movie, so I was texting a friend while I waited. And I got a text. and. Um, Normally this text would have been just, I would have glanced, replied, and that was it. But I was really tired that day and uh, a bit emotionally drained. And this text had to do with somebody getting reprimanded. And it wasn't about me getting reprimanded, but in that moment, that text pulled my panic trigger. I have panic and anxiety disorder and depression. And I have been dealing with these illnesses for about 24 years. My triggers vary. Sometimes they are the thought of getting in trouble, uh, the thought of conflict or fear of conflict. I worked at the legislature for eight years in issues management and media relations. There's a lot of conflict there. I went on stress leave twice before I was 30 working there. My triggers are also um, the fear of failure the fear of even just change sometimes can set me off. And all of these things stem from two incidents that happened to me in my life when I was younger than I am today. When I was 18 years old, I was the victim of a violent assault. And I never told anybody. 
for almost five years. When I was 21 years old, I was the victim of another assault. And I never told anybody about that one until this summer. These traumas, as I have recently come to call them, I never used that word before, um, changed my life. And while I'm not ready to tell the story about those traumas tonight, I guess I'm kind of telling the story, um, all I can say about them is me too. Me too. When I was in high school, before I was 18, I was a really vibrant young woman and I was outgoing and I did all the sports and I was in drama and I was in choir and I was a very happy person. And after these events, I completely withdrew from my life. I wore black a lot. My friends thought I was turning into a, uh, what's the word? A goth, thank you. Yes. Oh, she's gone goth on us. Um, but I wore black a lot, and I hated my body. I hated it. And I, all of a sudden, my life was infused with this dark depression that I'd never experienced before, and this anxiety that was always present. And it would come upon me in times when I least expected it, and it was a racing heart, or like someone sitting on your chest, it was fast breathing. It was a feeling that something awful was going to happen to you. And I didn't talk to anybody about this until it started getting really bad. I don't know if anybody out there has had panic attacks. They're not pleasant. They are all consuming. They kind of drop on you like a bomb out of nowhere. And you almost feel like you just can't control anything. Your heart races, your breath <sighs> goes really fast, and um, you just feel like you're gonna die. It's really frightening and scary. And um, I finally had to ask for help after they started to get really bad. It got so bad that um, I would black out just like that. My body and my brain couldn't take it anymore, and I would, I would black out, I would just fall. It happened at home. Thankfully, my husband, who's here tonight, was always there and talked me back to where I needed to be. We used to go to a friend's place every Friday night. It happened there at their house once. I just blacked out. Ended up on the kitchen floor, not sure what had happened. I remember being at the 13th Avenue Safeway once, having a panic attack. I was holding onto the shopping cart so hard I thought I'd snap it. I had to call my husband to get me home because I didn't know how I'd get from the grocery store to my house even though I'd driven it how many times. And so I finally went and talked to a doctor, and she diagnosed me with panic and anxiety disorder and depression, and put me on medication. And so I'm still on medication. Um, once I thought I'd go off, I thought I was doing really well. I was in shape, I was eating well, I felt great. Little did I know that it was the medication that made me feel good, both all of those things. And I went off cold turkey without talking to my doctor. Not a good idea. I ended up in a darker place than I ever could have imagined. So I'm back on medication, and I am on medication. And it is one of the things that I need to have good mental health. I am one in five, ladies and gentlemen. There are a lot of us out there who deal with these issues every day. So I need medication in what I call my mental health toolkit. I need some other medication, too, to cope. I need to eat well. When we eat like crap, we feel like crap. I need my sleep. When I'm overtired, I am more susceptible to being anxious. I also need to exercise. Those of you who know me well know I exercise with extreme ferocity. It makes me feel good. I am a much better person when I exercise. I am a better mother. I am a better partner. I am a better friend. I am a better everything because it makes me feel good, so I exercise. I need to see a therapist. I have been seeing a body talk therapist for the last seven years and just this summer I started seeing a therapist again to start dealing with some of these traumas that have recently unearthed themselves again. And I also need to breathe. Yes, we all need to breathe. It's part of being human. But breathing and purposeful and mindful breathing is so important because your breath has an amazing ability to calm yourself. Last year, I was in Red Deer, Alberta, and 
I had a panic attack on the Spartan race course. <coughs> we were going to run. I had been really sick for a week. I started to feel better and decided, well, I'm okay, I'll go race. And so I ate lots of food and lots of fuel. And we got to the start line and they sent us off. And in seconds, some, I knew something was wrong. I had nothing in the tank. And I was going much slower than I normally went. And so I just thought, okay, just go slow, send everybody off, give them a wave, they're doing great. And I just kept running. I caught up to a friend and we did a couple of obstacles. And then we missed one. It was that ugly rig with monkey bars and rings and our, I don't know, a nunchuck and a ball. It was awful. We both failed. So we had to do burpees. Remember those ugly things? And we go to do burpees and I couldn't do one. And I'd been training. I could do 108 in five minutes at one point. I couldn't do one. And all of a sudden I started to panic and, and I couldn't breathe and it was like, like you can't even speak that kind of panic. And here I am standing on a race course and there's people doing burpees all around me and there's people doing obstacles and there's spectators and my girlfriend is doing burpees and I finally got her attention. And uh, she came over and <gasps> I couldn't breathe, I couldn't even say anything. She got, I don't know, a medic, a volunteer, someone came over and she just reminded me to breathe. And so I found my breath and <sighs> it's pretty amazing what your breath does. And I just kept breathing and breathing and breathing until I was okay. And we went on to the next obstacle, which was a spear throw. They make you throw a javelin into a hay bale. And you can only like pass if it sticks. If it falls and hits the ground, it doesn't count. We stuck it. We nailed it. And that was exactly what I needed. And I finished that race. And then I ran another one that day, too. <laughs> I'm not that crazy anymore. So back to the kitchen <coughs> and the text that I got that night. And it's like full on panic. It was like the atomic bomb of panic bombs. I knew something, it wasn't good. And I'm in the kitchen and I'm by myself. My husband's out there and my kids are asleep and I'm just hanging on to the island. And I know it's gonna be bad. And I know, I hadn't blacked out in a long time and I knew that that was coming. And I'm gripped onto the island and somehow I had the wherewithal to get over to the couch. So I figured, well, as long as I'm on the couch, I'm not going to hurt myself when I fall. And I got over to the couch, and it was, it was, you know, your heart's racing. It's like someone squeezes onto your heart. You're just squeezing, and your heart is tight, and you're breathing fast, and your mind starts to go to that place where you're in a fight or flight mode, and it's just, it's terrible, and it's terrifying and everything starts to go black. It's kind of like in The Princess Bride when they fall into the uh, quicksand and they're like, there's that last moment of air and suddenly in this moment, something inside me said, stop, you know what to do, just push play. Don't fall in the hole, go across. And I don't know where that came from, but I started to breathe. And it wasn't the breath I was just talking about, the it was like full on labor breathing. And I'm breathing like this and I just kept breathing and something inside me just keep breathing, keep breathing, keep breathing. And I don't know how long I was there. I was closed my eyes, I'm on the couch and I'm breathing like this, I'm sweating like crazy. And I might've been five minutes, it might've been 15, I don't know. But all of a sudden I, I opened my eyes and I realized that I was okay and that I hadn't fallen down to the hay, I'd actually gone across. For the first time in 24 years, I figured out how to cross the obstacle with my breath. And that was monumental. That was life changing for me because now I know when the panic comes because it's going to be a part of who I am for a long time. But at least I know. It's like on the obstacle course. When you fail an obstacle, you can always come back and train yourself. How am I going to get that rope? I've run probably 16, 17 races. I didn't get a rope until my very last race. I rung that bell. It was so satisfying. But you can always get up and try again, even if it takes 24 years like this did. And sometimes you just have to dig deep and find something inside you and take that single step 
or that leap across the way. It reminds me of a story that I read to my kids at night. We found it at the library a few months ago. It's called Little One Step. And it's about a trio of ducklings and they are lost in the woods. And the little duckling has really short legs. And he's tired and his legs are wobbly. And his older brother says to him, well, all you have to do is take one step. You stick your leg out like this, say one, one, and you step, step. And then you take the other leg and you lift it up and say one, step, one, step. And so this little duckling walks around the field, one step, one step, one step, one step. And they call him little one step. And eventually he gets to where he needs to go. And it's just that, that one step. And so I know that all of our obstacles are different. Mine is trauma, panic. I can't believe I said all this out loud. Yours may be different. Some of us are dealing with diagnosis or illness or loss <coughs> or grief or harassment or bullying or immense stress at work. But remember, you can always take one step. It may be a teeny tiny step, maybe a giant step, but I'm hopeful that you'll find something inside of you to take one step, whether that's one step to figuring out what do I need in my mental health toolkit or my coping toolkit. Maybe it's not a mental health issue. Maybe you need something to cope. What do I need when I find that dark place? When I need to get out, what do I need? I mean, me, medication, exercise, eating well, there's a lot of things that I can draw upon, and I'm not always good at finding them. None of us has it all together, but we all have the ability to take those small steps. And maybe it's a small step to talking to somebody, whether it is a professional, your doctor, a therapist, someone you love, or maybe it's taking a small step to talking to somebody you love that you see is struggling. Because at the end of the day, the obstacle truly is the way.